What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Victory Life Legacy Spotlight. I have a longtime friend, guest of the show, mentor, my man Bruce Garns, equipment manager for Virginia Tech. But truthfully, in my opinion, and many other guys like me that play the tech, he is much more than that. <laughs> he has been at Virginia Tech for a long time. Really, he's seen the rise of the program, not just in football, but in all sports. And he's on our show to talk about his legacy, his insight, and just share some funny and insightful stories. Bruce, how you doing today, man? Uh, Dwight, I'm doing good, man. Thanks for having me on. Uh, this is the biggest thing I've been on in my life. I made it. I'm on Dwight's show. We'll talk about the Hokies. Uh, <laughs> a little fun. Yeah. As DJ, uh, DJ Parker doing that. Man, I need to call to get on that. No question, man. And I'm, I'm honored to have you on, man. You, you know, you have a unique perspective. Um, I met you as a, as a freshman. I ended up red shirt in, in 94. And from that moment on, whether you were roasting us or giving us insight and knowledge, you have been one, looking back and now that I have perspective, you've been one of the more insightful men I've ever been around. Um, you've been around some of the more iconic figures in Virginia Tech from Bud Foster to Frank Beamer, Coach Height, but not just basketball. We'll talk about the other coaches as well. How long have you been at Virginia Tech, and what, is it, what has it been like for you? Because you've seen the rise of the program when they were independent, Big East, and the sports were in different conferences, and now they're in the ACC, and they have more than football. They have other sports. But what is, how long have you been there, and what has it been like for you? Uh, I came to school here in August of 1989, the white man. I've been here ever since. Uh, majority of my life has been spent here in Blacksburg. You know, they say this is home, and it's definitely home for me, but uh, – it's been a place that's, you know, that's been good to me and uh, was had opportunity, like you said, for a long time to work for Coach Beamer and Coach Boulin and the football staff and getting to know guys like you. But it's, uh, I've seen the change in Blacksburg since 1989. I think back then we were a uh, good school, really good school, but maybe more of a regional institution. And Coach Beamer came in here, got the football program going in the right direction and it opened up doors. You know, we got on TV and more people will see Virginia Tech and you get out here and you see that it's what a great place this is. It's a little small town. If you know, if you don't like small town out in the country, this wasn't for you. But uh, it's it's changed, man, from the Big East, from independent to the Big East. We won three championships in the Big East and got an ACC and we won four. But, uh, you know, we did it. I'd like to say we did it the right way with, you know, good people. Yeah, yeah. Good people. We Coach Beamer from the top down the – our players, we you know we had some tough ass dudes on our team, but who were really good dudes, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing about Virginia Tech is, you know, 30 years later, 20 years later, me and you, we still friends. I got a group of friends. I don't know how we get work done because all we do is text all day. We got a <laughs> chat line going, and um, but it, it, that's that's the part that I remember most is the guys in our locker room and you know seeing them become dads now. You know, I'm a dad now. I'm a old dad, but uh, I'm a dad. Um, and I like to, you know, hopefully my son will go up to be like some of the young men to come through our program. No question, man. And, you know, you talk about relationships. Um, it's amazing to see what um, so many guys are doing. Um, the, the Coach Beamer coaching tree, I meant, mentioned this on Twitter one day, is pretty remarkable. And you've been there for all of that. You've seen guys like Cornell Brown, one of your close uh, friends, and J.C. Price, Lauren Johnson, Pearson Prelo. So many guys that you saw come through that program are now coaching. Did you ever think you would see so many guys coaching the way they are and having an impact on the lives of others? You know, uh, I think a lot of times when you play sports, everybody assumes that you're going to go into coaching. But, you know, if some of those dudes, I knew Lauren Johnson would be a great coach. Uh, I knew Cornell Brown was a great player. I didn't know that he was going to turn into a great coach like he is. I knew Torian Gray would be as good as coach as anybody who put on a headset, and I think he is. Uh, but those dudes, man, I don't know about the coaching part of it, but I've watched their path and them grow up to be, you know, good citizens, man. That's the part that I'm proud of. You know, you get, you know, I sit here and I look back and I get emails and text messages from guys. Hey, coach, thank you for what you did for me. Cause I was in a, you know, I was in a different perspective, me and coach Berlin. We won't, we didn't coach, but when you needed somebody to talk to, you could come in our office and we we're going to shoot you straight. I mean, whether you wanted to hear it or not, yeah. we're going to shoot you straight. We're going to give you the right answer. I mean, you could be mad for a few days, Damn, Bruce, man, I ain't doing this. You own me. But then you get the notes back and say, hey, man, I got a son now. I understand that. And I've, you know, I've grown from some of those. You know, I get, I got a letter from uh, Cam Martin about a year ago. And he goes, 
I can remember, Coach, we were standing out at practice one day. I said, Cam, what are you going to do when football is over? You know, he had the micro, micro fracture knee surgery. He said, I don't know. I need a job. I said, well, call my friend here. He'll give you a job. And he's still at the company. He's, he's an executive at the company. Ten years later, he wrote me a nice note and said, thank you. You stayed on us, but this is what we need. And that's the kind of thing that I appreciate the most. And like I said, the friendships and the bond we have 20 years later. Yeah, no, no, you're right. And, and that's what I, I see now, man. Like, even when I come back to Tech, we joke, we hug. But then I remember a lot of the little nuggets you passed on to me and all the guys I came in with me. Tony Moe, Marcus Parker, Ken Oxendon, Big D, Derek Smith, Ty Washington. That was my group. And we still joke, but also reminisce on all the stuff you told us and all the things you've seen. Uh, I do want to ask you, though, you mentioned Coach Beamer. Um, I remember as my five years at Tech as a red shirt all the way up to my senior year, you know, on the road at hotels and after meetings, you would give us funny stories and tell us about, because you had that unique relationship where you were around Beamer and the coaches, you know, when right. they were fathers and men. Um, right. Did you ever think that when you were around Beamer, because you were there during those lean years when they were talking about firing him. And right. it's, it's, it's funny to reflect on it now, but at that time it was serious. What kind, what kind of man is he personally? as far as just how he, he is as a coach, a person, and why do you think he was able to sustain that rough start and overcome well, it? You know, man, uh, coming from a guy who's been here a long time, you know, there's nothing in my life the last 30 years that was important that I didn't ask Coach Beamer about, Coach Beamer and John Moline. When I proposed to my wife, I went and said, Coach, this is what I'm about to do. And he goes, oh, are you sure you're going to do that? And I'm like, oh, yes, sir, this is what I want to do. But, uh, you know, I think the reason it worked with Coach Beamer after the hard start is he never wavered in what he believed we should do. You can be a good football player, as he would tell you. You can be a tough SOB on Monday. You can be a tough SOB on Monday through Saturday, but when that game's over, we're going to be good citizens of, of this university and of, and of this town. You know, and uh, he never wavered. He always said, I can remember meeting him, and uh, he go, he, we'd be in those recruiting meetings. He goes, one of these days we're going to the Sugar Bowl, we're going to the Orange Bowl. You know, we're going to play for the national championship. I've been a 19-year-old manager like I was. I'm like, oh, this dude believes. You know, and I'm like, maybe we will one day. And, you know, the day came and we finally came. You know, we start beating people. You know, go to Orange Bowl, Sugar Bowl. We win the Big East and all that. And uh, he would always tell you, you probably remember, he would always tell you, take care of the little things, Dwight. Yes, and the yes. big things will follow. You know, tuck your shirt in. Turn your hat around, Dwight. You know, and his, <laughs> you know stuff like that. And I, and I still, to my day, to this day, I go in and I work out, and I literally I have my shirt tucked. And they go, those young dudes, man, why you got your shirt tucked in all the time? I said, just like breathing, man. It's just the way I was brought up. You know, and speaking of Coach Beamer, you know, the good dude. We play a lot of golf. Is my new passion now. We play a lot of golf together, mm -hmm. and it's good. Is he? You know, he gets to he gets to hit it from way up the fairway for me. So, a quick story. We were playing. Um, the first four times we played, he beat me like a drum like just wore me out and owe him two bucks or whatever, have to pay him. So the next, so on the fifth time we played, I'm beating him. He goes, no, we're not quitting. We're not quitting. So he wanted, he got me back to tie. So the, so we were playing and he's got this back brace. He puts on his back brace. He's got his pants on. He's got little white socks. I go, coach, um, is that back brace? Cause he always talking about what's legal in golf. I go, is that back brace legal? He goes, what? I go, is that back brace legal? He goes, no, oh, you shouldn't worry about the back brace. You should worry about getting your ass kicked by a 75-year-old man in golf that's wearing a back brace. <laughs> but that's the day I finally beat him. But, uh, you know, and I learned a lot from Coach, man, and even in the golf game, he goes, you can learn a lot about a person on the golf course because if a guy move a ball on you, he's cheating you. If he can move a ball and cheat you, he's going to cheat you in life. Mm. So, you know, he's, he's just – He's never wavered on what he believed in and doing it the right way. And, you know, we, we had some problems at Virginia Tech, you know, throughout the 30 years. Everybody has problems, but, you know, we got through it. And, uh, and I say as good as program that there is and there was in college football for a long time, you know, the one thing we didn't do, we just didn't win at all. But on a consistent basis, you know, we were pretty good. You know, um, you look at Gene Chizik, he won a national championship at Auburn. Yep. He's no, you know, and he gets fired at all, but he wins one. Would you rather win one national championship and be done in three years, or would you have a 30-year career like Coach Beamer have? And, you know, and that's something, you know, people 
should think about. You do it the right way for a long time and you put a university on the map, you change a town. Mm -hmm. And in that process, mm -hmm. you change a lot of young men's lives. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned another guy who has been there a long time, like yourself, who also saw the rise of Virginia Tech athletics, not just in football, but in other sports and the growth of uh, the program going into different uh, conferences, eventually everyone going to the ACC, and that's John Berlin. Um, you mentioned about how when we were there and then the guys that came before me and after me would come in the office when they had issues, not just with tickets or just issues with drama, recruit. I know John Berlin pulled me a few times asking about what happened on recruiting, hosting visits and all of that. Right. And, and, but, but it was all because he had a lot of work to do. I don't know if everybody watching this show and people that will watch this and people affiliated with the Virginia Tech program know how hard John Berlin worked. And you and him both did a lot of stuff. And Beamer trusted you both. Talk about what John Berlin meant, John Berlin meant to the program because people don't, people don't understand. Like, they see the jokes, the sarcasm, him roasting right. you. You two together were, you two together were dangerous. Dangerous. You know <laughs> dangerous. Yeah, yeah, real you know dangerous. You know, the white man, and I have no problem in uh, John Boleyn, if he watches this, be mad because I mentioned him. But I honestly, 100%, with everything in me, believe, not because he was my guy and still my guy, I believe that he was the glue to our, to our program. From the start of when Coach Beamer started there and when he retired five years ago because there's nothing that went on in our program that he didn't have his hands on. Mm -hmm. You know, you could come in and you got problems, he gonna tell you how you need to sell it. Or he gonna come in and he goes, hey man, you can't do this. We're not going to act like this. And you know, you need to hit the road. Like I said earlier, he'd make people mad. But the thing about John is that if you own John Boleyn's team, you own John Boleyn's team. He can take us doing wrong. You know, 18 to 21 year old kids, hey, we're going to have some problems. Yep. Uh, hey, Bruce, go in and talk to this dude, see what he says. If I need to handle it, I'll handle it. But I uh, just, just, and still to this day, he gets stuff done around here that nobody knows about. And, uh, I think one of these old days when John's not around because it won't happen while he's here, that he needs to be in the Hall of Fame at Virginia Tech because his, everything he's done for me, he does stuff for all the sports now. That is, you, it's just you can't, you can't measure it. You know, we, we never, if we were on the road, very rarely did something go wrong. The plane was always on time. Yep. We had the right meals. We had the right room. And if we didn't, nobody knew about it because he handled it behind the scenes. And, um, He's uh, he's been you know he's been in my life for a long time and he's he's probably my favorite person in the world, man. You know, other than my wife and kid, he just he still to this day takes care of me. He calls me, check in, he check in on the baby. And we I go over there every day for about ten minutes, and we still we still sit around and talk. And we like, hey, you remember when the white Vic did this? And we getting old now though, so I don't remember who you play with, it all runs together. Like Yeah, it does, I know. It, it runs together. You you know that, you're getting older, but we sat around, we talk about hokey football, and it, and we still just lack. And Coach Beamer gets in there, and I wonder what that guy's doing. And he's, have you talked to him? I go, yeah, Coach. And, you know, he, we, we always talking about the guys we had in our program. No question. You know, you talk about um, guys you had in your program, and all you guys did. I remember uh, my – Red shirt freshman year might have been a Sugar Bowl year. Yeah, you know, you you did everything. And I used to wonder how you and Belen specifically knew everything. And I remember you had one of those times where it was your turn to check classes. And I had a biology class and yeah. I overslept. And I got the class at 815, but you had already checked. And I saw you later at practice. I said, Bruce, man, you know I was there. He said, Don't matter, Victor. You gotta go see Gentry. <laughs> I said, man, I don't miss that class. He said, don't matter. You're supposed to be there. But, you know, I was in my feelings, man. I was a young kid, and I had that Wednesday morning. I only had two in my five years, which is great compared to some of my boys. But at the same time, I remember you were like, look, you were like real with me. You're like, yo, you got to get to class. You know, beans ain't playing. And those are things I now teach my three children and even some of the kids I mentor and coach, man. Um, you didn't have a problem with doing those things, man, because you were able to – still have your bond with all of us and yet be a mentor and still hang out with us, the Keons, the Cornells, the Mannies, the Gildersleeves, Tony Morris, and so many guys. And yet you can still have the relationship with the Coach Heights and the, and the, the Stein Springs. Um, what does that say about you? Is that intended on purpose or are you just able – some guys can't do that. You, you know, the white man, it, 
it, some of those times it was a tough situation because we all were friends and, you know, I didn't want, and sometimes they would say, man, you're telling the coach, I would never tell a coach. And I think they know now that we're older, anything that went on that we were doing. Mm -hmm. And they know that our coach is going to find out. And, you know, I was just fortunate, man. Um, those dudes were my friends. I, and you all were my friends, but I did have a job to do. You know, mm -hmm. I had a job to do. And I wasn't, you know, going to, like you said, turn you in. I knew you were a good student, but, well, you didn't turn Dwight in, so you can't turn me in. So you get some of that. But so uh, – won a whole lot of favoritism, but, uh, you know, it, it was tough at times. I mean, I think you told coach, no, I didn't, man. You, coach know you gonna stay in. If you're in trouble, coach know you're in trouble. The ones we had in trouble were the ones who were in trouble all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, you know, yeah. you had five or six of them. You know, sometimes people didn't go to, hey, I'll give you a break because we all had breaks in life. But, uh, you know, it all worked out, man. And like I said, it wasn't nothing too serious because we all still best buddies to this day. Oh, uh, no question. You know, um, it's just, I look back, man, I think back. Just like the other day, about a month ago, was the first time I've been back in Lane Stadium through the tunnel since Coach Beamer retired. And um, so, you know, they used to have the senior names up on yeah. the wall. So mm -hmm. now they got – they put, like, little hokey stones with every letterman in history of Virginia Tech football was up. Really? Like a UU letter. Like, if you're a four-year letterman winner, your name's not up four times. Your name is up for the first year you letter. So John Lynn walked me in there. He goes, do you like this? I go – do I like? It's got a little emotional because it's the first time I've been through the tunnel and he started pointing out names. Like, you remember Dwight Vick? Yeah, Dwight Vick, Captain, Virginia, Officer Guard. And he just started pointing out names and brought me back. I go, damn, man, we were pretty damn good. We've had some <laughs> really, really good players and really, really good people in our program. And it just took me back. He goes, you all right? I go, yeah. I said, Coach, this is the first time I've been through this tunnel since Coach, since Coach Beamer retired. He goes, really? I go, yeah. And I go, that's nothing personal or anything. I just, you know, don't get to go through the tunnel anymore. You don't work football. Yeah, you don't yeah. go through the tunnel. And um, But it, it was, you know, you go back and you see all those names of those dudes, man. It was pretty cool. You know, you, you mentioned some names. And I'm, and this is one reason why I was excited to get you on the show, because you mentioned I'm getting older. We all getting older. But there's, there's wisdom. And I feel like these are the golden years, because you can reflect but still keep pushing forward. When I talk to, I do a lot of radio and on 106.7 The Fan and stuff in the New River Valley area. I have this podcast and other podcasts I do. Um, I've always said that Mike gets a lot of praise for what he did. Absolutely. And he should. But you have the unique perspective. I think, and this is me, and I've said this to Mike, and he agrees. I think guys like Cornell Brown, Maurice DeShazo, and Antonio Freeman you have to look at as well. They yes. have to go in that conversation because obviously TV conference, the bigger the platform, the more exposure. We were in the Big East. You start winning conferences. But I've said that in 95, if Abima had, he had already gotten the ball rolling in 93 and 94, but 95 was still him building something. We started it off atrocious that year. A tough loss. 0-2. Oh, 0-2, oh, a tough loss to BC. And then you had a, a really embarrassing loss to Cincinnati at home in Blacksburg, yeah. shut out. But if he doesn't win and run it, you don't know who has to come back. You don't know what changes the AD makes, right? That's right. Paul Weaver. That's Dave Brain. But th th what I'm saying is there were players on that team that kept the ship tight. And even before that in 94 and 93, I mean, Antonio Freeman is one of the best receivers ever in the history of the program. And I feel like guys like him and Cornell and J.C. Price and Maurice Shishajo don't get mentioned. What are your thoughts about some of those players and also the importance of Cornell Brown and J.C. and Jim Barron and those guys, Hank Coleman, the leadership yeah. there to keep it, keep it going? It's so funny, man, that you mentioned that class um, because, you know, like you said, in 95, we started off 0-2. We lost to Boston College, and we had a, a bad loss at home on a rainy day. I can remember like it was yesterday against Cincinnati. And uh, all I remember is going into that locker room, the little halftime house down there, and Antonio Banks gets up and says, we're not going to lose another damn game. And I'm like, okay, cool. And we got Miami the next week. And we never beat Miami, I don't think, at that time in history of Virginia Tech football. And he said, we're going to win. And, you know, we got there next Saturday, and they throw the ball up down the sideline, and Lauren Johnson makes great play after great play as a true freshman. Yes. You know, we didn't – and we won that game. Okay, we're one and two. And we ran the table. Ran the table. And, uh, you know, 
those dudes kept us together. But to go back, you know, Mike Vick, de de deservingly so, gets a lot of credit for putting Virginia Tech football on the map. But what people forget that, some people forget is that we went to an Orange Bowl and a Sugar Bowl before Mike Vick comes to campus. You know, Cornell Brown was a top 20 recruit in the country. And Coach Beamer would tell you he think Cornell Brown's recruitment was the biggest one of his career because it gave us some credibility with the recruits. This kid could go anywhere in the country he wanted to go. And Cornell said he's going to go to the University of Virginia Tech. <laughs> so, so, you know, we get Cornell and, you know, Maurice Shajo, who's in the Hall of Fame here, is had a pretty good run here as a quarterback. Well, you know, hold, just hold on, hold on. Talk, because let people know, because, again, uh, no, we weren't ACC. There was no Twitter. Just talk about, like, you know, Maurice, man, because you told me when I was there, because I was there one year with Maurice. I was a red shirt. And, you know, when I was over there getting Ward and Gatorade, because I was a backup, you were like, hey, do you really know how good Maurice is? Because, you know, we came in my class chirping Ty Ward at 757. And right. you got Richmond boys. You were like, listen, that guy won the best athletes in the history of Virginia. And then you have yes. Freeman, who you told me was just as good as basketball. But I mean, just talk about those two guys. Yeah, uh, you know, Maurice is old. You know, Maurice from down home, man, down in Henry County. So I'm always going to be a fan. And, you know, to this day, Cornell Brown will argue that he calls Maurice the GOAT at Virginia Tech as a, in, as a quarterback position. And, you know, rightfully so, Maurice was, was before his time, man, I think a little bit, you know, at college football, you know, black quarterback. There's been some black quarterbacks, but, if, you know, who could run, who could throw it. And, uh, you know, just – he just was out there and he was athletic, man, and probably, probably a better basketball player as, you know, than, the, than he was a football player. And, you know, we'd go and go down there in the uh, intermules and they would beat people by a hundred. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they go down there and hit talk and get thrown out of the gym. And then, you know, you got a guy like Antonio Freeman who to this day, you know, we used to play JV games. If you didn't dress, you had to play Hargrave or, uh, well, Fort Union. Union. And he played on a JV game on a Thursday and had about 12 catches. And mm. Coach Beer goes, oh, God, this guy can play. So we dressed him. <laughs> and he played. And he played good. And the rest is history. You know, this this is a guy who, from Baltimore, could have went a lot of places. Wasn't, you know, wasn't very fast, but was a great route runner. Uh, we lived together for a year in school. He's, But he just, you know, was competitive. And we had a lot of those dudes, the white back then, that was overlooked recruiting, wasn't four star, wasn't five star, and they came to Virginia Tech to prove something. The JC prices of the world. I can remember JC came here; he had hair down his back. I'm like, who is this dude? What? This dude can't play. <laughs> Long hair. I go, but JC Price. Now you lined up with J Death Row. You lined up and put Death Row out there. JC Cornell, Jim Byrne, that crowd, Waverly Jackson. And we were, we were pretty good. And then our mother, the Cornell, was very highly recruited. Hank Coleman, you know, we just we just built a program on guys who wanted to be here. You know, in the history of Virginia Tech football, the White has probably only been four or five, five stars we've ever landed, if yeah. that many. Yeah. You know, so we built it on kids that, man, I got an offer from JMU, but I'm going to walk on at Virginia Tech and you earn a scholarship or you weren't highly recruited and stuff like that. So it was always our practices – were more intense than games. Yes. You know, you know, on Tuesday period six, what it was going to be? It's going to be middle drill. Middle drill. Middle drill. For yeah. as long yeah. as I worked football, Tuesday yeah. period six was middle drill. So you knew what was coming. That was part of the reason we were good because you knew every day this is how practice is going to go. Whether it's good or bad, we're not standing out there any later. This is how it's going to go, and, and we followed the script and and turned this thing around. No, you did. We did, and that's why I, I just reflect on those days because twenty some years later. Now, as a father, you talk about Beamer's quotes and even the guys you mentioned, man, I'm doing part of what I do because of the relationships and what those guys showed me in practice and how they carried themselves. And the personalities, you mentioned Free. I mean, Free and Maurice, I got there, I was a red shirt, but they talk so much trash. I mean, it didn't matter, like Maurice and Free, especially it could be anything. We could be playing pool, you know, yeah. and, and Free, Free was just, and Freeman just talked. But he backed it up, man. Um, were you surprised when he went to the NFL um, and he and Brett Favre connected? I mean, he had sports to the top 10 catches on Monday Night Football in the Super Bowl. He had, to, at the time, it still may be the longest reception in Super Bowl history. Yeah. Um, were you surprised Free excelled the way he did? Uh, I, 
you know, not been a football coach and nothing like that. I just knew he was – I knew he he ran great routes. He was a competitor, but his speed wasn't what some people wanted at times. Mm-hmm. But I knew if he got a chance, you know, he's going to do the things the right way. He's going to make a – you know, go across the middle, gets his jaw broke. He's going to make a catch. You know, he had good hands, and he was, you know – and. Am I surprised? No, I knew he was. I knew he was really good. He's, and uh, you know, free made a lot of money in the NFL, man, and made some tough catches, won the Super Bowl, and um, and to this day, he still talks about the Green Bay Packers. You know, I'm a Cowboy fan, so okay. I went out to Lambeau Field with him. Um, uh, the Dez Bryant catch, no catch. Oh. So I'm in Lamb. I'm sitting in Lambeau, me and free. We the box all these old Packers, and I got my sweatshirt on. He said, don't wear that Dallas Cowboy stuff in here. So I'm in there, and they they decide on whether the catch or not. The dude goes, why aren't you excited? I go, what? He goes, that wasn't a catch. I go, yeah, that was a catch. He goes, are you a Cowboy fan? I go, hell yeah. So I had to, like, fight my way out of there, though, but it was cool. <laughs> but I never got to see free play in Lambeau. That's, you know, some of those things, you know, I like to see some of my older guys play when they play. Like now, you know, I wanted to go see some games this year, but – COVID's got us. You yeah, know, we'd like to see Tyrod in LA. Mm. You know, do his thing and all that. But uh I catch him on TV. You know, I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan, but I'm always rooting for the Hokies, man. It's in the league and until they play the Cowboys. But I want them to do good, but the Cowboys need to win. This is our year. Oh yeah. Well, y'all do have a squad this year. You do, you do have a squad, you know, and that's the one thing I remember when um Cornell stayed in Cochran his second year. I was in there just that one year. And I remember uh, when UNC was playing or the Cowboys, I mean, you and Cornell, man, y'all was yeah, so hard. Talk and had a great time, man, and talked so much trash, man. Um, but I want to ask you about another coach you were around. This was later on in the transition of the growth of the program. You know, I was watching. I didn't even know you were doing stuff with basketball. i never forget several years ago, uh, before they switched the roll up, you were working with the basketball program, Buzz Williams, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting here watching the game, me and my wife, and uh, Shanice is like, is that Bruce? I said, nah, man, Bruce don't. I look, you in Cameron Indoor Stadium. Gee. <laughs> on the bench, talking to the Cameron crazies, slapping high five. And then I also seen stuff where um, Buzz Williams allowed you to talk, you know, and, and, and speak to the team frequently. He, yeah. valued, he valued your input and insight, man. I don't know Buzz. I, I, I think he's a very intriguing guy. He definitely knows the game of basketball. I've talked to guys like Troy Mance, who coaches basketball at L.C. Burr High School, former Hokie standout guard, and he raved about Buzz, X's and O's, and ability to get the most out of his players. Um, you see that now with guys like uh, Jimmy Butler. Um, but you were around him, another iconic figure, maybe not as big as Beamer. But what are your thoughts? I mean, what was it like to be around him and, and have that role? And he gave you a lot of power to talk to his players. Yeah, uh, Buzz, man. Buzz, actually, you know, we got to be friends before I took the job. That's kind of the reason I got the job when football was over because we were friends. You know, we lifted together every day. He's really strong, and we pushed each other. But Buzz is a, Buzz is a good dude. Buzz is a little different dude. You know, he thinks a little different outside the box than most people. But, uh, you know, I told somebody the other day, he's, he's, got, a lot of, uh, he's got a lot of Bud Foster in him, you know, you're not – if you beat him with some once, you're not going to beat him with it again. I promise you. Your teams may be better. You may beat us. But you're not going to beat him with the same thing twice. And, it, and he just studies the game. And uh, I was fortunate to work for Buzz. Uh, you know, I learned a lot from Buzz. And I seen where Coach Beamer did it this way. Buzz did it this way. You can, you can be a champion doing it several different ways. And now, you know, I'm fortunate to have a guy here in basketball now, Coach Young, who's uh, – Got a lot of Coach B in him. You know, he's an older gentleman. Uh, he wants to be a basketball coach. It ain't all the Twitter and media and all that. He wants to coach basketball. But, uh, yeah, Buzz was good. Buzz was good to me. He was good to my family. And, you know, Buzz made a decision that he thought was best for him to move on to Texas A&M. And I understand. But, you know, our program and I'm not going to stop because Buzz is here. And I think okay. right now we got, we got opportunity right now. We got some transfers. We got some good young kids. Our basketball program's in great hands, man. Uh, and uh, Coach Young's, uh, he's good. He calls me the mayor. So the yeah. first day I met him, John Blaine introduced me to him. He goes, mayor. I go, okay. He goes, you're the mayor. That's what I would call you. So he calls me. So he came in. I think he won. We were like 12 and 1, 13 and 2 or something. I go, 
man, you remind me a lot of Coach Beamer. He goes, how's that? I said, the way you approach things, it ain't too, it ain't too much difference. He goes, the way y'all approach it, I go, he goes, oh, what's the difference? I go, well, he won over 200 some games here. You won 13. <laughs> No, yeah, our basketball program, we're going to be okay. You know, I like Mike Young. I, I, I think your comparison is accurate because I watch him. I see him. He's composed, but he's connected to his players. You see him on the bench. I didn't know if that was for, for just a routine, but he's eating the popcorn, not bothered yeah. by anything. And I want to talk about a game because uh, you, you were with Young when they were uh, with um, in, against Duke in the uh, Sweet 16, right? You were well, at No, but were you there with Mike Young? Were you on the bench? We no, that was with Buzz. You're right. With Buzz, with yeah. Buzz. So yeah. with Buzz, you're at that game. That was his last right. year. And Justin Robinson, one of my favorite point guards from up here in Northern Virginia, is an absolute dog on the court. And I often said if he didn't get hurt that year, they would have went on and made – they would have been a higher seed. Um, do you think if that layup goes in – because my son and I both said if, if they tie that game with the momentum and that crowd and that team that Virginia Tech had – we winning. I, I think I I go. I'm going on and say on record. I think Tech wins that game, and they also go and beat Michigan State. Yeah, I think. I didn't mean to cut you off. I oh, think what? we have a chance, man. But that game, if you go back and look at that game, Dwight, the crazy thing is we were down nine, came back. Nikhil gets a concussion. He's not playing. We came back. KJ put us on his back. Mm -hmm. The big fella, man, he put us on his back. And I saw one time Zion Williams. Um, Goal ten when the KJ he looked like he had his elbow above the rim, but the big fella came over and said, "Give me the basketball." So KJ, I think he ended up with like thirty-one and eighteen. And uh, but three of the last four shots we took in that game were air balls. I do Justin Roberts, yep. Justin Roberts's jumper, Ty Outlaw's jumper, and the meds. They say tip the rim on the layup, but I think what happened, the coach drew that play up. He said, "This is going to work," and the med called it too far out. He was. He really wanted to be about a foot or two closer where he was going to bang it on. Mm. But, you know, and he just had to lob it up and just didn't lob it up hard enough. But uh, I do think we'd have had a chance the next week because we were hard to guard, man. We were, we were going to put those five dudes out there that could shoot it. But it's uh, it's as good as a college atmosphere. Uh, in my years at Virginia Tech, I've been in football, basketball. The, it was D.C. The place was rocking. You know, they play Sandman. And you're like, damn, man, I'm going to get a chance to go to – we're on the lead eight if we can win this game. And you play at Duke and Coach K on the other end. And, um, you know, we gave it a run, man, but it just won't our day. But um, it's just it's just like some of those some of those close football games we lost, Dwight, you know, in the years. And, you know, speaking of that, you know, they go, oh, Virginia Tech can't win the big game. Well, we won a lot of big games. You won a lot of big games. If you win your league seven times, you won big games. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, I don't care who you're playing, you win big games. But I couldn't find out been in this business as long as I have, they're only big games when you don't win them. Like when you win a game, you win a big game, well, you're supposed to win. Yep. You know, it's, you know, you lost to you lost to Auburn in the Sugar Bowl. Well, Auburn was 13 and 0. Everybody lost to Auburn. You lost to Nebraska mm -hmm. in the Orange Bowl. Everybody lost to Nebraska. Mm -hmm. you, go to, you go to the national championship, they tell you don't win big games, but you're playing in the last game of the season. Mm -hmm. You're playing the last game of the season. You 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 playing a team who's been there two out of the last three years, and, and they beat us. Nobody else in the country beat them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, big games are the ones sometimes that – big games, they're only big games if you don't win. If you win them, well, you're supposed to do that. And that's, you know, that's a little crazy because I think we won a lot of big games around these parts, man. And uh, I think we'll continue to be good in all sports around here. And I enjoy Blacksburg. Uh, it's crazy. I think – Basketball, we're going to surprise a lot of people this year. I hope so. I actually, I, I, I like the style my young has, and I, and I'm, I've grown to really appreciate all the sports. You know, track, a lot of the stuff they got going on, man. It's, it's good to see because I'm, I mean, I'm old, and I remember when I yeah. got there, and the locker room was like something out the longest yard. You know what I'm saying? And the weight room was that dungeon, that little black weight room at the end of the hall, and I was like, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm here. But that's so funny you said that because we got these kids around here now, man. They got like nutrition oasis and all of the locker room and stuff. And they go, man, Carolina got this, Duke got this, Alabama got this. And I go, but well, this is pretty good. You should have been here when we built this. You should have been here when we playing in the national championship game and we get in our locker room we did and we're dressing in the 
back gym. Mm -hmm. You know, we're dressing in cage lockers and all. Mm -hmm. And I heard a dude tell me the other day, he said, uh, it made sense. He goes, well, you know, those guys always say Carolina got this, Alabama got this. He said, well, you should have been a better player. In, you should have been a better player in high school. You could have go to those. You could have went to those places. I go, no that question. makes a lot of sense. I can't take credit for that, but I laughed. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. But you know what? And maybe this, this will be a good question for you because I do want your thoughts on this. I've often said, even when I played, but definitely since I've been old and I've, been, I've covered the game and I watch – and I love college sports, football and basketball. But you mentioned Virginia Tech and you mentioned you should have been better. I've always felt, and this is nothing against um, the new staff at Virginia Tech with the football program or even the basketball program, but I feel like what Bema started – and other coaches like him, Bud Foster. I believe there's Virginia Tech guys. I had a bunch of offers like Cornell, and um, I had the UVAs, the Ohio States, and Oklahomans, but I felt like I was a Virginia Tech guy. Um, I, felt, I feel like when you're recruiting, just like in corporate America, you're going to fit a culture. I feel like Virginia Tech has to get the right guys, and not just in football, but even in basketball. I'm not, and it's nothing against Duke. You know, Duke has transformed this program. Coach K has evolved. You know, he went from the Greg Paulises to getting guys like Avery and Maggetti, and then he went in full-fledged and, you know, Zion and all. And that's fine, Cam Reddish. But Virginia Tech guys in football and basketball and even women's track, they got to be Virginia Tech people. Do you share those same sentiments? I uh, 100% agree. You know, uh, and I think when you say Virginia Tech guy or young ladies, is somebody's going to come here, you know that you got to work your butt off. You got to go, you got to work hard. You got to lift weights. You always ain't going to be the most highly recruited person in your sport. And you just got to come here. And this is, like I said, like I said earlier in this talk, that it's out here, man. And it ain't for everybody out here. If you don't like it, you know, this is a tough place. You know, it's a tough place to get to. We've always said that recruiting in football, it's a, you, in order to go to Virginia Tech, you got to want to go to Virginia Tech because if you're flying from somewhere, if it ain't D.C., straight to Rono, you got to make a connection, just leave here for two hours and then get it, or you're going to drive from over there where you all at five hours and you pass the University of Virginia, and you're going to go right through Charlottesville to come here, or are you closer to those ACC schools? But, it, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I think we have a culture out here. We had a big culture out here when Coach Beamer was coaching, and uh, we wanted guys who wanted to be here. You know, that was part of the battle. I want to be here, you know, and um, – and, you know, you could have said, man, I'm going to Virginia's ease. I can get there in two and a half hours. My family can come and see me play every week. But, uh, you know, I think you knew when you was coming to Virginia Tech that you were going to play tough, hard-nosed football. And, you know, and if, if you beat us, you beat us. But we're going to give you our best. And, I, and I, was all, I was talking to Coach Boulin the other day, and I said, I wonder what the racket was when we had this thing rolling when Coach Beamer was going. The week after we played a team, I wonder what that racket was the next week. Oh, yeah. Oh, you, they're, they're beat up, man. Even those dudes are tough. You know, they're tough. And, and you know, they all, and Coach B would always say, when, we, when people were beating us when we first got this thing started, they would say, and Coach is shaking his hand in midfield, man, that's a tough football team. You know, y'all going to get it going. Then all of a sudden we start beating people. They say, hey, good game today. Walk off, you know, because, you know, the, the tables had turned. You know what I mean? And, you know, and I would like, and I may do that one day, just look back through the years and see what the per people's record was the following week. Because I, I bet it's not very good because, you know, we beat you up because we just do, we had something to prove. And our coach had something to prove. The defensive coordinator, offensive coordinator, and, you know, I think we had some really, really good coaches here, man. And, you know, and we always been known for defense, but I honestly believe we had some really, really good offensive players at Virginia Tech, some good offensive coaches who recruited a majority of these players that don't get enough credit. I agree. I agree with you 100% as well. And you mentioned defense. Just quickly, or let's talk about Bud and Coach Wiles, because, and Almation, because, again, you've been there a long time. And I hit some, some, some younger fans with that on Twitter one day. And they would hit, you know, who? I said, listen, Coach Sharpless and Coach Almation. Almation to this day is one of the most brilliant defensive minds you will ever be around. One of the most intense coaches. Matter of fact, when I was interviewing Cornell and J.C. Price for their legacy spotlight, I was talking about, and I, and I reminded them about that time frame, my first year. You talk about personalities. You talking about Beamer. Gary Tranquil was offensive coordinator. Yep. 
Todd Grantham was the D-line coach. Bud yep. Foster was the linebacker coach. Sharpless was coaching, I think, the DBs are working with them. The yeah, Rovers Whips. The Rovers and Whips. Then you had Almation. And then you also had, um, I think I already mentioned Bud Foster. I don't think Wiles was there yet. But you had a group of personalities that were very, very intense. And you had Coach Grimes. J.B. Yeah, Grimes, Coach Grimes. That's right. One of the <laughs> shortest offensive of linemen, but one of the best offensive of line coaches I've ever seen in my life. I love playing for him. And everybody was, what you mentioned, that coach, they were hard-nosed, middle drill, practices, seven on seven. It was trash talk. Coaches getting each other's faces. And the practices were hard. Um, what was it like you watching Bud and Grantham now, who was a, a, a defensive coordinator himself and um, always typically a head coach candidate, Bud Foster, you know, had his opportunities and those guys, man. What do you remember about those guys? And what was it like seeing Bud Foster take over what Almation started and evolve it into the lunch pail D? Yeah, you know, man, it's, it's, it's so funny we talk about that because I was just chatting with Cornell about this the other day. You know, Phil Almation walked in our first meeting when we were going to hire him, and I was a student there. We were going to hire him to be the defense coordinator. You know, we walk in. People lay back in chairs waiting on the meeting. He walks in. He goes, shut up. Get both feet on the floor. Shut up. We're going to do this thing the right way. He goes, and he literally turned around. He goes, me and my wife are going to a bowl game. I know too many people. We may not go, but me and my wife will watch a bowl game somewhere. But if you all do what I tell you to do and do what Coach Beamer tells you to do, we're going to a bowl game. And, you know, we went 93, 83, whatever, went to the Independence Bowl. You thought we was going to play for the NASA championship. It's the first one, but uh, to this day, it's probably my favorite bowl game I've been to. Mm. But then, you know, he leaves and Coach Foster and Coach Sharpless become co-coordinators and and start the lunch pail defense. And Coach Sharpless leaves the next year or two, and Bud, Bud just ran with it. Bud Foster's a genius, man. Uh, you know, Bud's one of my favorite people. Uh, he's just – he just demands he demands excellence from you. You know, you get out there, and if Bud tell you to do something, you're gonna do it. And you know, and they and, and you know, and, and part of us too. He has some really good players, you know, but he coached them up. He has some really good players, and he coached them up. And um, the good thing about those dudes, man, like you said, they get in each other's face, but it was nothing personal. You know, it's like, oh yeah, my yeah. squad is better than yours. And then at the end of practice, hey man, we all in this together. Nobody cares about anything. And, you know, we talk about coaches now. I think another one who gets a lot of people you agree with and a lot of people don't know was Mike Gentry. You know, Mike Gentry yeah. is, is anybody in those 25, 26-year run we had because you knew Monday – well, when you play, you lifted Sunday after a game. Yes, yes. You lifted Sunday, and you knew on Wednesday you can get that scout team lifted and go out and practice for two hours. <laughs> And, you know, he, he was the man. Mike Gentry said, jump off that ceiling. You want me to go head first, coach? You want no back talk. You want none of that. But you knew he had your back. Yeah, man. I, I, I still have my binder, my maroon binder, man. And I still, even now that my son and daughters are in sports, I, I find myself reflecting on all those life lessons he taught us. And um, everybody I've interviewed, even Lisa Witherspoon, the great female yeah. basketball player, credits coach Mike Gentry. Everybody has been on this show that's – part of Hokie Nation athletically that was privileged to be around him, mentioned their influence that's still impacting them today. Jared Ferguson was just on and he mm -hmm. named his business. He got a business with Shannon Taylor called the iron something, I, but it was something relative to giving credit and all the uh, respect to coach Gentry. That's you right, man. And that was just a, a golden era, man, a great time. And speaking of that, man, you had the unique perspective of being around not just Virginia Tech athletes, but you in basketball and football have been able to, whether you on the booth or on the sideline, see some of the greatest athletes in ACC, Big East, and just college football and basketball history. Did you ever be like, you ever hit yourself like, man, this, I, I love what I do? Because you, I mean, you're talking about the new era, seeing Zion Williamson and all those guys, and then seeing guys at Carolina, and you know, those guys, and then the Cam Chancellors and Cornell Browns and Mike and Tyrod. These are not just guys that, you know, you're going to find in the skating ring. These are iconic athletes. And I'm forgetting some people. Did you right. ever find yourself just being a fan or you were working? Did you ever just take a step and just look and be like, yo, this guy. Oh, yeah, I do. 
<laughs> you know, I do, man. Uh, I do a lot in basketball. You go out there, you see these dudes in the ACC in basketball, you go, oh, yeah, that's first pick in the draft. He could be top five because they're one and done. But, you know, the white man doing games at Virginia Tech in football, you know, you would see me in games. I'd be going crazy. You know, I had a lot of fun, but I was – it wasn't for show. Sure. I did it because I really felt good about winning games. And then I seen all the work you all put in all year. So now the greatest thing now is the ACC network. You know, I get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. They got the Nebraska – Tyrod Taylor against Nebraska game along with Danny Cole. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he has Danny Cole down the sideline. I'm running down the sideline. And um, my wife goes, what were you thinking? I go, we just need to win. And uh, but Danny Cole, you know, Danny Cole is another one who was a really great player, <clears throat> under recruited. I love him. But I, I got to talk more stuff about Danny Cole than anybody because you know he was a wide receiver and he was he was wearing people out, and I would just go down, I'd be going crazy about Danny and the DBs would be talking back to him. I go, You're talking now, I got you now. I got you. If you're talking back, if if I got if you engage in the conversation with me, this dude's gonna wear you out. But yeah, man, I uh I sat there and I remember Cam Chancellor. You know, I watched the game that night, the Nebraska game, the last play of the game, he hits the dude. And I don't know if the dudes woke up yet. You know, Cam and um Ryan Whitaker from down your way is one of yeah. my favorites. I can remember Ryan Yale and yeah, I've been those games and I catch myself now, you know, I still got a DVD player at my house. And you know, the old the old football guy burnt me some old CDs about five years ago. So I get up at like four o'clock on a Saturday morning, throw in the tape, I mean, throw in the DVD and watch games from back when you played or the uh, Independence Bowl and all that, just watching, man. I, you know, and, you know, it's funny. My wife said, I can't remember the load of dishwasher, but I can remember every every play in every game. <laughs> and uh, so it's funny, and she gets on me about it, but at about six o'clock, she's down there watching it with me. So it's, it's cool. Oh, no, they're nostalgic because the same thing happens here in my house. We – my wife and I, and I show my kids, and they were like, that's him? I said, that's before he went to such and such team. Yeah. You know, and that's another thing I'm glad you brought up, because part of my, we, we, my family, uh, even though my kids are active athletes, and we got a lot, I work most weekends, I still set time around tech games. I also watch the other ACC. I love college sports. And um, one thing I've enjoyed, especially when tech was playing, when you were with the football program for years after I left, I would see you trash talking the other team. You they come over the side and I see you over there. But see, I know you. You enjoyed that because you took what you and Berlin were doing to us in the game. I mean, in practice, and you That's were right. doing. That's right. I was practicing. <laughs> one time it looked like a, I don't know if it was UVA. It was UVA. It was one of the intense games, and I seen dude come back. And I'm not gonna repeat what you said, but you know you yeah, came. Yeah, you, you came on TV, <laughs> and I can't repeat it. But yeah, it was uh, especially UVA games, man. You know. Uh, I'm a Hokie man, and, and somebody asked me the other day, said, what's your favorite place to go on the road in football? I go, Charlottesville. They go, why? They go, they don't have great crowds and all. I go, yeah, they did when the Hokies came. I go, but, you know, you go to Charlottesville, when we had it going, you know, you was going to win. Mm -hmm. That ain't nothing. We was going to win. We had good teams. We had some good battles, and, um, you know, they they hated us. We hate them just in a, you know, respectable way. But uh, I used to love going there, man, and you get on the bus and you turn the corner, you go up by the stadium, they got all the orange and blue out. And probably my favorite one, though, was I think it was 2011, the last – we went to, to the uh, ACC championship game and our punter was struggling, so Danny Cole punts. He had 255 – he had 250-yard punts. He called a touchdown. Bucky Hodges, everybody goes crazy. You know, they, they're the one they would have went. You know, we beat them, beat them pretty good, and uh, go down and play Clemson, and the things didn't work out for us. But, uh, yeah, I was I was a talker, Mike, and uh, I'd be in the meeting sometime, and Coach Barry goes, rewind that. <laughs> Bruce, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, Coach, he, was, he said something to me. You responded? I go, yes, sir. We don't need that. But, you know, he he knew. He knew it was all a good fun. I was just excited about my team, man. I'm a, I get excited about the Hokies. I get excited about Hokies softball track, football, basketball, all of it. Because, you, you know, when you're a Hokie, man, it's, it's ingrained in you. It it's is. probably like that most places. But this is all I know. Did, 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 I never asked this before, but because you mentioned we had some tough losses, and that goes on everywhere. But especially with us, because Hokie Nation, it means so much to us. Did you mourn those losses as we did as players? Did it hurt you too? Uh, 100%. I mean, you know, maybe sometime, maybe a little more, man, because, you know, I go home and my wife – 
at my wife now, but my girlfriend at the time, she goes, no, you're not going to lay around here pile all night. You know, I go, yeah, baby, this bothers me. I've seen those dudes work hard. And um, she goes, well, Bruce, you go back to work tomorrow. I go, yeah, but you, you don't get it. You don't, and nothing, nothing against her. I said, you just don't get it, man. And, um, but, uh, she, but she, she, she got it. You know, she goes, but we got to move on. You know, she goes, well, your players, are they going to get over it? I go, yeah. I said, she said, well, they go, they'll go out and have fun. I said, yeah, they're supposed to because we, we teach you, hey, to move on. And some of them moved on quicker than others. And, you know, we get in that Monday meeting on that Sunday meeting when you play. Coach Baby goes, all right, we need to put this behind us. And we go on to the next one. So you, you have to do that in this business because it goes fast, man. You know, Monday and then all of a sudden it's Saturday you're playing and it's back to Monday. Even if you win, you don't have a long time to enjoy it. You know, and it's just yeah. – it's, it's, it's crazy, man. I just – and I've been through a lot of them. So I can't imagine, like, Coach Beaver and all them who – had to make decisions during games and stuff. Oh, you know, that's what people yeah. don't get spur of the moment. What defense you gonna call? We need to stop right here. What are you gonna call? What offensive play you gonna run? You know, and everybody can set up. And I sat in the stands for about two games after Coach Beaver was done. And I said, I never sat there again because it's 50,000 people who know what's going on. Oh, yeah, but it's zero of them to know what's going you know what, on. You know what, it's funny you mention that. And I, I've told my wife and other friends you know, because we have friends that are just alumni or fans of the program. They may not have gone there, and they invite you to a tailgate or a bar up here in the D.C. area. I don't enjoy it like that because I don't like hearing it, and it means too much. Now, any other team, yeah, I'll meet you for the LSU-Alabama game. Right. But for Tech, like last year when UVA finally broke the streak, I wasn't sick like we lost maybe a five field goal. It's just the fact that that's the really the only team and only program athletically I invest in emotionally. You know, that's right. my squad. So it hits that's different. Right. It hits different when they take an L. And 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 I want your perspective on this because you mentioned UVA. And when I came to tech and Maurice and Freeman, but UVA was the state's premier program. Um, Absolutely. I've, I've interviewed Terry Kirby. He was on this my legacy spotlight a few weeks ago. Great guy, one of the best to ever do it phenomenal athlete and we talked about he said hey I went to UVA because I'm a Virginia guy not UVA guy I'm an in-state guy I, I have Virginia pride and he talked about their vision him Sean Moore Herman Moore and all those guys and his cousin Chris Slade to put UVA on the map I was a youngin at the time in high school and I remember when they were number one and I remember when I was getting heavily recruited I surprised people because tech wasn't what we know now and then when you see there was a time, and I'm thinking it'll probably continue to some degree. Broncos got a, a good thing going, but I think Tech's a better program still. But, I mean, that run when Beamer and company went 20 and 1, 20 and 1, <laughs> did you ever think it would be that dominant? Because, you know, when I was there, it was, you know, back and forth. We win one, they win one. Right. They, two, we they go two. Yeah. You know, the, you know, the white man, when I first got here as a student, it was the same way they beat us a couple years in a row. You know, um, we were up 28 to nothing. We were up out here 28 to nothing, whatever it was. And, and the Mar Harpers, whatever, from down your way. Yeah, my boy, Ball Hawk. Mm -hmm. Catches the touchdown. You know, they beat us. And I didn't ever think we'd go 15 years in a row. I didn't because somewhere in there you're going to get lucky. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You're going to get a bounce. You know, uh, we out here playing them in the cold on a Saturday, Friday before Thanksgiving, and Cody Janelle. Yeah. He, Cody Janelle, they call, they call timeout, try to ice. He kicks it right through the uprights. We win. You know, we go up there, and um, they take the lead. My last year, I think, Coach Beaver's last year, and uh, dude busts one up the middle where we come back, and uh, we throw it to Malik down the sideline, and Bucket Hard just smashes the dude. We win the game by two or three points. So I thought somewhere in there they would get, they would get, you know, a chance to beat us. And it was some good games in there, but uh, nothing better than beating them. And you know, I was there this year when they beat us. You know, like last year here out of Lane Stadium, they had a chance to beat us. I thought that was going to be the year. I actually thought this year Tech was playing yeah. better. No one was playing better than yeah. Tech in the ACC, including Clemson. Yeah. Tech was that hot, and I and UVA had had struggled, but they got yeah. up for that game. Yeah, you know, and that happens, you know, in a rivalry, you know, in a rivalry that you're going to – you should be – you know, that's what makes it good. But, you know, Dwight, when we were really, really good here at Virginia Tech, and when Coach Beamer was – not that we're not really good now, it's not what I'm saying. When we were – when Coach Beamer was coaching, there was a time I looked when we played Miami, UVA, and West Virginia. When we were in the, we were in, in the Big East and we had it going. 
Mm-hmm. I think in a 10 year span, I think I reckon, you know, you play them three times, you play each one of them, you play them three games a year. I think in a 10 year span, I think we were like 21 and nine or 22 and eight. You know, if you're beating your rivals like that, you're going to have a good program. You know, yeah. you, your program, your program's good, you know, and you know, take you back to those days of out there in Lane State jumping to D'Angelo Hall against Miami, pick, takes it from Roscoe Paris down the sideline or Andre Davis. Wayne Ward knocks the dude out who he may still be sleeping on the punt return. Andre Davis scored three times in a row, yeah. three possessions in a row on that game, a punt return, a kickoff return, and he called a touchdown within like three a, touches. In, in a minute, in a minute and 30 seconds. So yeah, just, you know, just we, ha- we, we had some players, man, and I just, and I just like talking about it. No, I, and I like listening. I like reminiscing. Um, and you're right. I think the guys there now – uh, I'll dial in. It's just a different time. But in speaking of that, I do want to ask you, because um, you have this unique perspective as well, being around sports as long as you have. I hear this all the time from the guys my age or even a few guys a little bit younger than me, because um, we, we all do it as OGs and old heads. Or, you know, this generation is soft or, you know, they, you know, they entitled. I remember I came back and um, – uh, the coaches that were, this was around Beamer's last few years, and they were like, I don't know, they not, they were joking. They were like, these guys ain't like you guys, man. And I hear that, and I know they were just joking, but do you think, and again, things change, but do you think that the kids now playing, not just at Tech, but across the country, are built differently? Because I think when you look at the athletes, you look at guys like Trey Turner and these guys playing now, they're special. Um, but at the same time, you hear it on Twitter. You hear guys on XM Radio say, "Well, these guys are different, or they're soft, or what do you what do you think, man?" Well, I think part of it, Dwight, man. Um, I think it's different, and it's basketball's the same way. I think these guys, this day and age, they the coaches blow them up so much in recruiting. You know, you're the next great one. Uh, you're going to start when you get here. You know, and I understand you got to tell the kids something to get them to Virginia Tech or wherever. But I think. Part of it is, too, Dwight, is the game has changed, too, you know. Um, I heard a guy say spread offense and salaries are going to ruin college football. And I went, what are you talking about? He goes, coaches are getting paid too much, you know, and it's it's getting out of hand. And then spread offense, you don't tackle in practice anymore. You know, you're out there to spread offense, Mm -hmm. and, you know, you ain't got a fullback and all that. I'm not a football coach, but I understand what he's saying. You know, we used to tackle. We tackle two or three days a week, y'all would tackle. But now, you know, you're in you're in pads one day a week. And that's kind of like pro football. They only tackle 14 times the whole year. So that's why all those missed tackles. And I don't know that they're softer, but the generation changed kind of like the NBA. You know, you touch a dude now, it's a flagrant foul. I think it's just times changing, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, well, he couldn't guard him from 20 years ago. Well, he couldn't guard him either because he's too tough. You know, yeah. now if you touch somebody, and it, I think it all goes back, though, Dwight, you know, it, it's all on everything you do is documented on Twitter, and you're living for likes. Well, I want somebody to like this versus, well, I'm going to go out here and do what we need to do to win. I'm going to be the toughest dude. And like I said, everybody's worried about being a five-star versus, hey, I'm going there and try to change the program and try to win some games. Mm-hmm. And kids, this day and age, man, I think not that they're not team-oriented, but everybody who plays college football now, plays college basketball, they're going to the NBA or they're going to the NFL. And that's, that's not happening. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's 85 dudes on scholarship in a college locker room. And with the ex- exception of five or six programs, 75, 80 of them ain't going to play pro football. Yep. You know what I mean? They're going to get jobs and, be a professional in something else. And I always tell my guys, man, you got to be a, prof- you got to be a pro at being yourself. Just be yourself, man. If it's meant to be, it's going to be, you got to be, you got to be who you are. You can't be nobody else because this game, this college stuff eats you up, man, because it's a full-time job. It's mm-hmm. absolutely a full-time job. You lift, you come over here, you get shots up or you lift and you go run routes and football. You do it all summer. There's no downtime anymore. And, uh, you know, and it's, and it's it's different. Yeah, I I do have uh, a few more questions uh, for you. And you're right, it's different because things change. I'm one of those guys. 
I think every generation has its, its calling and every generation has its differences. I mean, the reality is the guys before me, man, when Basham and Basham and those guys came in to see us, they said, y'all soft. Y'all got oh, the yeah. locker room. I, I think it's just about perspective. But speaking of perspective, man, I had the opportunity to meet uh, your lovely now wife, the privilege of my, when me and my wife were in town for a spring game and you were telling me you engaged, man. Um, what has marriage and fatherhood taught you? I mean, because, you know, yeah, because I mean, like I said, I've known you since I was 17 years old, man. Right. And even though you've seen me and my, my teammates grow, we grew up in a lot of ways together. You know, just all the different changes we've gone through. We lost some good ones in Keon and yep. Rich and, and um, Coons, Brian Edmonds, God yep. rest their soul. But that's life. And one day it'll be our time. But uh, yeah. But what, uh, what, is that, yeah. what has that taught you, perspective? You know, man, um, I wait till I was 43 years old to get married. I was one of those dudes, I ain't getting married, don't want no kids. And, uh, you know, I found the right one, man. And uh, like I told you, I went in and I bought an engagement ring and I left it in Coach Beamer's desk drawer for three months till I got my nerve up to ask her. And uh, But she's been, uh, you know, my wife, man, probably like your wife, she's been a rock for me, man, you know, through the good, the bad, uh, you know, those at the end of Coach Beamer's, you know, when uh, Coach Beamer retired, um, John Boleyn came in my office, and he had always told me, now, Bruce, when this is over, man, you're going to be the first two to go. Because that dude's going to bring his own football. I people, and I go, I got it, Coach. So I'm sitting in my office a Sunday, I think after we played Virginia. And um, he came in, shut the door. He goes, uh, the new guy's not going to keep you. I go, okay. He goes, you got 30 days. You got 30 days to get out of your office. I go, 30 days? Let me go down here and get some boxes. I'm going to be out this thing in 30 minutes. So then the first thing I thought about, I said, man, I got to call my wife. So I said, no, I'm not going to call. I'm waiting to get home. She goes, what's wrong? I said, hey, babe, they're not keeping me in football, but all this is going to work out somewhere. We got to move. We got to move. She goes, wherever we go, we're going to be a family. So, you know, we, um, we, we got to stay here and then, you know, she didn't want kids. And one day, one night, she was sitting there and she was crying. I go, what's wrong? She said, I want a baby. I go, what? She goes, I want a baby. I go, okay, well, let's have a baby. You know, we've, uh, we tried, you know, if you got kids, it ain't as easy as people think to have kids. No, it's you know, not. So, you know, and I don't mind sharing. My wife is sharing. We had to do in vitro. We did in vitro and the little man finally got here after 31 hours of labor and uh, been the greatest thing I've ever done in my life. You know, he's two. He turned two, two, two weeks ago today, and he runs the house, man. Is no daddy, no dad. I said, don't tell daddy. No, he goes, no, sir, daddy. <laughs> so it's been good. But, you know, Dwight, um, it's changed, too, because, you know, everything that's going on in the world right now, in our country right now, oh, man, man uh, political and the social unrest. And, you know, I'm married, have a great wife, great kid, but my wife happens to be a white lady, and I have no problems, you know, you, you love who you love. So we're just sitting at home right after the George Floyd thing, man. And um, she goes, she's crying. I go, ask, what's wrong? She goes, you need to change. I go, what? She goes, you need to change. I go, what are you talking about? She said, you're loud. I said, I've been loud my whole life, baby. It's not, she goes, but if those cops pull you over, you need to change. I go, okay, I get it. I said, but everybody wants us to change. Mm. Everybody wants us to change, but nobody wants that officer to change. Nobody's talking about that officer needs to change who put his knee on that dude's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. I said, you don't get it. I said, she goes, what do you mean I don't get it? I said, nobody in the world understands how it feels to be a black man except a black man. And I said, mm -hmm. I don't know how it feels to be a white lady, a black lady, or a white man. I understand how it feels to be a black man. Nobody else can tell us mm -hmm. what it feels like. And she goes, you know, you're right. I hadn't thought about that. Then she wrote this long Instagram post, and and I don't, you know, I don't do no social media, know, fella, yeah, nothing. And um, uh, and she got all these things. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, you know, and I'm like, she goes, well, people responded to it. I go, yeah. And I guess my point I'm getting at is, I worry now that I have a two year old son who. So you don't have to grow up with this. You know, if he puts a hoodie on, you know, I have to tell him keep your hands attended to, ask to reach if you get pulled over and all. And most of the officers are good officers, but most of the black men they run into are good black men too. Nobody says that, you know what I mean? And I don't, 
you know, I didn't come on to talk about that, but it's, you know, it bothers okay. me because of what, the, of what we're living in now, man. And, uh, you know, I got to raise a family and, um, and we don't, you know, a lot of it ain't happened out here in the world. You know, we're a little bit far removed, but, you know, I watch CNN for 20 hours a day if I can, you know, and it, it, it bothers you because you, you know, you, you try to do things the right way. I'm going to try to bring my son up the right way. Not that he's going to be perfect by any means, but, uh, I'm going to try to teach him what's right and wrong in life and you treat people with respect. And I will tell him, like my mother told me, you're no better than anybody else and nobody else is any better than you. And I, no and hopefully we can do it the right way. You know, you mentioned the right way and um, doing things in the right manner and, and what you live with and what you've experienced. Overall, you know, from my perspective and just knowing you, you've been a great person and you've done things the right way and you've been blessed by that. This is the part of my show where we end with you giving some perspective to all the viewers that'll check this out. Um, as I mentioned, this goes on the Victory Life Facebook page, the Victory Life YouTube page. We have a lot of, we have a large platform. We have people that check out our, our interviews. Your final thoughts on what life has taught you thus far, your legacy, what you would pass on if your son sees this video 20 years from now, and then even the Cornell Browns and all the guys in our circle, when they see this, who is Bruce Garns and what has your life taught you so far? Uh, I think who Bruce Garns is, is just a, you know, good old country boy from Martinsville, Virginia, who uh, came to Blacksburg, got opportunity and ran with it, you know, uh, and was fortunate enough to work for a guy uh, that was a Hall of Fame coach, but more than a Hall of Fame coach, was a Hall of Fame person and taught me a lot of things. But like I said earlier, the main thing he taught me is just do the little things in life, man. Do the little things and the big things to follow. It's kind of like I would tell my son, hey, man, you, you ain't got to go. You ain't got to be out front all the time. You know what I mean? You just just be yourself. Be a pro. Be yourself. Do things right. Always respect people. Don't matter the skin color. Always respect people. You know, help people, do what you're told, try to do things right. And, you know, like I said, I think I try to do things right. And, um, you know, and I've been fortunate. And I've ran into people like you and all those other people we talked about in our lives here at Virginia Tech. And, um, you know, as much as y'all think y'all learn from me, I probably learned more from y'all. You know, and I was telling people I talk a lot, but I listen more. You know, I would listen like, oh, okay, this is the way this dude feels. I'm going to use that. You know, but – uh. Just gotta, just gotta be a pro at being you, Dwight, man, and just do things the right way. And uh, I think part of it is, and you know, I, I don't know if a lot of, you know, I'm a, I'm a church going man, and you know, I try to keep God first and try to do things that's right. Am I perfect by any means? No, not perfect. Uh, but uh, my, my family, my friends are important to me. Uh, my faith is important. Uh, I just hope I can do. My parents did all they could do for me. We wasn't rich by any means. It was eight of us. My parents did all they could do for me, and I'm going to do all I can do to get my son ahead. But my son's going to work hard. My son's going to, when he's 17, 18, and want to get a car, want to get a, he's going to get a job. It's not going to, hey, now we rich by any means. You get, okay, save this much money, and mom and daddy will match it. You know, and I, want, I just wanted to be, be like you guys, man, like most of these guys. Just be good productive citizens in your community and and when he grows up and have kids and unless you have him young I'm probably gonna be gone I want him to say hey your grandfather was a good dude you know your mom your grandmother's a good lady because uh we both have great families and um we all get along and I think the world now man it's just it's such a crazy turmoil our country's in turmoil and I think we've been people people trying to split us down the middle. We, 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 don't, we don't need to do that. You know, it's just, we live in the greatest country in the world, greatest country in the world. And are we going to have problems? Yes. But everything doesn't need to be aired. Well, then that's the, but that's the world we're living in now because this could be on in 10 seconds. You know what I mean? Everything is, everything is out to be seen. There's nothing's private anymore, you know, but I, you know, I can leave you with this, man. I'm, I've been fortunate. This town has been good to me. The people in this town have been good. I don't have had many problems, and uh, I just got opportunity, man. And uh, like so many other people, and I ran with it. And I, 
I think a lot of it has to be, you don't have to be the smartest person in the world because I'm not, but you have to treat people right. If you treat people right, do things the right way, they're going to help you out. Well said, man, and I completely agree. And that's something that Beamer taught us and that we're teaching our sons and daughters and our mentors and mentees and everybody involved, man. Bruce, this has been a lot of fun, man. Um, I appreciate you very much for jumping on. I'm glad we connected. Um, this has been insightful, you know, nostalgic, reminiscent, man. So I appreciate you. Uh, please pass on my love to your family as well as to the coaches um, that are still up there helping that program reach uh, new heights, man. I appreciate you, man. And I know a lot of guys are going to enjoy this when they see it, man. Um, all right. I appreciate you having me on, brother. Yeah, man. And to all the people that support Victory Life and check out this episode, man, I want to thank you again. And like I say, every episode, make sure you leave a positive impact and a great legacy. Enjoy. Thank you.